The commercial drone industry is one of the fastest growing industries in the world. But in order to fly drones for money or business use, you have to have something called a remote pilot certificate. And in this video, I'm gonna show you exactly how to get it. I've broken the process down into nine steps for you. The process involves creating some accounts on government websites, taking a 60 question test at a testing center, and you guessed it, filling out a ton of government forms. We'll cover it all in this video. My name is David Young. I'm a licensed FAA advanced ground instructor and the founder of Drone Launch Academy. Let's dive in. The first step out of all the steps is to make sure that you are actually eligible to become a remote pilot in command and get your remote pilot certificate. As far as what a remote pilot certificate is, you can think of it like a commercial driver's license for a drone. There are three requirements that the FAA has for you to become a commercial drone operator. Number one is you have to be at least 16 years old. I guess they think if you're old enough to safely operate a car that they think you're old enough to safely operate a drone. The second one is that you have to read, write, understand, and speak English. And this one trips some people up, especially if they're from another country coming to the US and wanting to get the remote pilot certificate. But the reason for this is, is that English is actually the international language of civil aviation. So anytime you're gonna be communicating with the FAA or maybe even talking to the air traffic control towers or someone else involved in the aviation process, everything is done in English, even if you're in a foreign country. And the third and final requirement is that you have to be mentally and physically fit to be able to safely operate a drone. That's a bit subjective, but I think you'll probably know it when you see it. For instance, if you can't see anything and you're blind, it's gonna be hard to safely operate a drone because you're not gonna know where it is. Also, if you had the unfortunate event of having both your hands chopped off, it's also gonna be hard to operate a drone unless you can figure out some type of other method to do it safely. So you have to be mentally and physically fit to fly a drone. They're gonna ask you that question when you go to do your application to get the certificate. So. They just want you to know that up front. If you're not sure about your specific situation, you could always book a time to speak to an FAA medical examiner. I'll put a link in the description below where you can go and find a medical examiner near you. Now, the second thing you need to do is get an FAA tracking number or something called an FTN. You can think of this like your student ID or social security number for everything that relates to the FAA. Now, to get an FAA tracking number, you have to create an account on the IACRA website. IACRA stands for Integrated Airman Certification and Rating System. Yes, that is a huge mouthful full, but hey, wouldn't be the government without some crazy acronyms, right? All right, I'm going to fly through this next part because it is pretty boring, but I will put detailed instructions down in the description below if you really want to dig in. But let's go through this. You want to go to the home page and at the top right, click register. After that, you're going to see like a thousand check boxes and the one you want to click is called applicant. Then you're going to want to fill out all of your personal information. In the first section where it says certificate information, you're going to leave that blank for now since you don't have one. So for the rest of it, you're going to put in your name, your email, your date of birth, create a username, password and then register. Now on the next screen, you should see your FAA tracking number along with your username for the IACRA system. Now make sure you take a screenshot of this number, your FAA tracking number, or write it down somewhere because you're gonna need it to sign up for your test and to register and get your license once you pass your test. So make sure you don't lose it Make sure you have this number. All right, on to step three. After you have your FTN, the next thing you're gonna wanna do is start studying for the FAA's Part 107 exam. This test is technically called the Unmanned Aircraft General Small UAG exam, quite a mouthful, but everyone else in the world generally calls it the Part 107 exam. Now, this exam is 60 questions, all multiple choice, and you're gonna have to pass it with a 70% or higher to actually get your remote pilot certificate. So that means you need to answer at least 42 of the 60 questions correctly. This test is taken at a testing center where you're not allowed to bring in any cell phones or anything else. I'll dive into scheduling the test here in just a sec, but let's first talk about what's on the exam. Here's a list from the FAA as to what is actually on the exam, but having taken this exam several times myself and having trained over 25,000 other people people to take and pass it. Let me tell you what's really on the exam and what you actually need to focus on. The main types of questions that always trip people up are sectional chart and airspace questions. You're going to get these sectional chart questions and what sectional charts are, they're basically just like aviation maps. Uh, you're going to need to know how to interpret them, how to read them, what the different symbols mean, and be very familiar with how to know if you can or can't fly somewhere. So from what I've seen, these types of questions about airspace sectional charts typically make up about 40% of the test, sometimes half. The next biggest area you're gonna to wanna to focus on is drone regulations. You need to be very familiar with the part of the federal code that deals with drone laws. This is 14 CFR part 107, which is where the test name part 107 comes from. You're gonna to need to know everything from how fast you can go, all about drone registration, if you're coming from a foreign country, accident reporting, all these different rules that are specific to drones that they're gonna ask you questions on for the test. After regulation, I would focus on weather. You're gonna to need to know all about how different types of weather impact drone flight and drone operations. You're also gonna to need to know how to read certain weather reports that pilots use, something called a METAR, which 
isn't really that useful as a drone pilot right now, which is basically a series of letters and numbers that tells you about the weather at a certain location. This is like deciphering one of those codes that you used to get in the cereal box when you were a kid. So will you use this in your day-to-day -day life as a commercial drone pilot? Probably not, but the FAA still wants you to know how to read it since it is an aviation weather related information item. After that, you're gonna to need to know all the other stuff that makes up the exam, the lesser portion like weight and balance, physiology, emergency procedures, crew resource management, radio communications, airport operations, and maintenance procedures. I know it feels like a lot, so in order to help, I put together this seven day study plan PDF, and I'll link it down below in the description if you wanna go download it. But it shows you all the specific topics you need to study. It shows you how to register for the exam, how to break it down, which topics you should study on which day, uh, that way you can pass the exam in seven days and have kind of a good plan going forward. So if you want that, it's down below. Once you've done enough studying to feel like you're ready for your test, it is time to register for and schedule a time for your exam. Right now, all the Part 107 exams are administered by a company called PSI. They have a direct relationship with the FAA and they do all of the testing. Now their fee to take this test is $175 every time you take it. And it goes directly to them. It doesn't go to the FAA, so don't complain about that. So if you fail, you have to pay $175 to take the test over. So make sure you're prepared and ready for for it the very first time you go into it. All right, if you're wanting a walkthrough of exactly what to do on the PSI site, I'm gonna go through that really quickly. So if you're trying to follow along in detail, just slow the video down, but I'm gonna go fast in case you are bored to tears by this section. All right, you're gonna go to faa.psiexams.com. Then you're gonna create an account. Now, do you remember that FAA tracking number you got in step two, the FTN? You're gonna need that here. So create an account with PSI using your FTN and your first and last name. Then you're gonna click through some user terms and it's gonna bring you to a screen where you have to give them your email address and then create another user name and password for the PSI site specifically. Then it's going to ask you for even more information like date of birth, phone number, address, citizenship, and military status. All right, now you finally have an active PSI account. Now on the next screen, you're going to see a list of like 50 different tests you can sign up for. You're going to want to find the one at the very bottom of the list that is called Unmanned Aircraft General Small with the abbreviation UAG. That is the official FAA name of the Part 107 exam. You're going to select that one. It's going to double check with you twice that that's the exact exam you want to take because after you take it, you can't get a refund for it. Then they're going to ask you about the number of times you've attempted the exam, including the one you're currently registering for. So if you've never taken this test before, you're going to put one because this is your first attempt. If you've taken it once in the past, you're going to put two because this is your second attempt and so on and so forth. Now, the next part might confuse you a little bit. It's going to ask for authorization category. You are going to select none because you don't need any authorization for your first attempt on the FAA 107 exam. Now, if you fail the exam and you go to take it again, you're going to have to wait at least 14 days to do a retake and you're going to need to bring your score report with you to the testing center. So if that's you for the authorization, you're gonna select failed airman knowledge test report. They are really rubbing it in that you failed and you're coming back again for another one. All right, and then on the next screen, it's gonna ask you if you need any test accommodations. So answer that, move on. All right, then it finally takes you to a screen where you can select a testing center and book and register for a specific time slot. Now, if you wanna see the location of testing centers in your area without having to go through all this rigmarole of signing up for a PSI account and all this nonsense, you can just go to that main PSI FAA homepage that we went to at the beginning of this step and click find a testing center right there in the middle. We'll make sure to put a link down in the description of the video below in case you wanna go directly to it. All right, after creating an account on PSI, booking a testing center date and time and paying for your test, you are ready to go to the next step. Step five is to actually go and take your test. Most of these testing centers are at airports or flight schools, so sometimes they can be a little bit tricky to find. Make sure you give yourself a few extra minutes to get there so you can get checked in, know where you're going, and get settled in before your test. The only thing you're gonna need to bring with you on test day is your ID. It needs to be some type of government-issued ID, like passport or a driver's license. Now, you can also bring a magnifying glass with you if you want. That might sound a little ridiculous, but one complaint I have heard from people is that the charts that they give you to read on test day can get a little fuzzy and the resolution is not that good so a magnifying glass might help you be able to see the charts along with these i've never had that problem in my experience taking tests but i've heard other people complain about it so it's up to you uh, there really shouldn't be anything complicated on this test math wise so you really shouldn't need a calculator if you can add and subtract numbers you're smart enough to do the math on this test uh, in your head or on a scratch piece of paper you just give me really simple written two questions like hey if you're gonna fly over this tower you know, 400 feet above it how high can you fly above the tower so you're just gonna take the height of the tower add 400 feet and that's literally all the math that they're on this test. But with that said, technically you can bring a simple calculator with you onto the test, but there's also a calculator function on the computer that you're gonna be using. So you really don't need one, but it's up to you as well. What you cannot bring with you into the test is your cell phone or an iPad or some other type of electronic device. When you go to take your test, they're gonna give you a little packet, which are your test supplements. And that's gonna have all the stuff in there, like the maps we've been talking about, uh, some of the weather charts, some other graphs that you're gonna need to use and reference while you take your exam. It will also give you a scratch sheet of paper and some pencils for jotting things down, taking notes, doing this. 
and anything they give you, you have to leave with them when you leave the testing center. So you make notes thinking you're gonna take those home with you to study for next time, not gonna happen. Give everything that they give you, give it back to them at the end of the testing. You're gonna have 120 minutes, so two hours to finish all the questions. You only have to answer 60 questions or on multiple choice, so that's about two minutes per question. Honestly, that is way more than enough time. Uh, out of 25,000 people that we've trained to take this test, I have yet to hear one person complain that they ran out of time. Most people said they finished in way less time than they thought they would. One nice thing is after you finish your test and you hit submit, you will instantly find out if you passed or failed. And you'll also get to see all the questions that you missed. Now, it's not going to tell you the right answers, but at least you can get an idea of what topics that you were weak on. Once you're all finished and hopefully passed, the testing center is going to print out something called your knowledge test report. This is going to have your score on it, a little bit of info about the questions you missed, but most importantly, it is gonna have your exam ID and your FAA tracking number, which you are going to need for the next step. And a quick side note, if you do happen to fail your test, make sure you hang on to this knowledge test report because you're gonna need that when you schedule your exam retake. You have to bring that same paper back with you and hand it to the people at the testing center. That brings us to our next step, step six, which is where you will fill out a form to officially get your license. The exact form is FAA form 8710-13 awesome government numbering system. Basically, you're just going to log on to the IACRA system that you set up in step two and request that the FAA process your test that you just took. So I'm going to run through this real quick in case you are at that step and you want to do this. And in case you're interested in seeing how the process works, you're going to see what you need to do when you get here. So number one, you're going to go to the IACRA homepage. You're going to log into the account that you created earlier in step two. Then you're going to click start new application. The system might prompt you to add new information like eye color, weight, height, and some other personal details. Now, this may seem like a bit of a stretch for data, but the FAA actually requires this information for all airmen, which are regular manned aviation pilots and drone operators. So once you update that, it might bring you back and you might have to click start application again. But once you do that and you get to where you need to be, it will look like this. You're going to select pilot, then you're going to select remote pilot, and then the rest of those sections should just automatically fill. Then continue on and it'll prompt you about some questions on if you can read, write, speak, and understand English, and also ask you if you have any type of criminal drug history. Then in the basis of issuance section, this is where you're gonna enter that exam ID that you got from the testing center report. You're gonna need that exam ID along with your driver's license or some other type of identification. Then the last set of questions they're gonna ask you is if you've been denied an airman certificate before and if you are mentally and physically capable and fit to have a remote pilot certificate. Once you enter those, you can go ahead and review and submit. Once that's submitted, the FAA will check that stuff against the score report from the testing center and then send it to the next step, which is the TSA background check. Step seven, there's really nothing for you to do except wait. The TSA is going to do a quick background check to make sure you're not a terrorist or a spy. You know, since terrorists and spies typically comply with government rules. But once they make sure you're not a terrorist or a spy, they're going to make sure you haven't committed any other major crimes. And then they're going to issue you a temporary airman certificate. Now, if you're wondering what types of other major crimes would describe qualify you from getting a remote pilot certificate, put a link below in the description to the TSA website where they talk about disqualifying offenses, waiting periods, and all that stuff. Most of the ones that are on the disqualifying list are like serious felonies like arson, murder, stuff like that. But it generally takes TSA about 48 hours to do this check. It can take longer if they've got a big backlog, but everybody I know has had it in about 48 hours. It's been done then they can move on to the next step. Once your background check is clear, you can log back into IACRA, look on that main page, you should see the status of your application right there and be able to view and print your brand new temporary airman certificate. After you have this temporary certificate, you're now officially a certified remote pilot and can operate as a remote pilot in command. Basically, you're a commercial drone operator. One thing to note, make sure you keep this paper with you anytime you're flying your drone. This is your license. So if you're out there flying and a law enforcement officer or someone else comes up to you and they need to see proof of your license, this sheet of paper is what you're going to give them. All right, in step nine, the FAA is going to mail you your physical remote pilot certificate in the mail. This little card right here. This can take several weeks, sometimes up to like six weeks. So be patient with it. Now, honestly, this doesn't really change anything for you other than just feeling more official by having this card you can put in your wallet and carry around with you. Uh, you still have all the same rights and privileges that you had before when you had your temporary paper certificate. Uh, but now you're just official. You can sign the back and uh, you have a little hologram on there. It feels nice to have. So once you have this card, don't lose it. Put it somewhere safe. 
Um, I usually put mine in my wallet or sometimes I'll put it in my drone case if I'm only operating with one drone. So if you have one drone, you can slip in that drone case. That way you always have it on you when you're flying your drone uh, or put it in your wallet. The very last thing you need to keep in mind is step 10. One of the requirements for having a valid remote pilot certificate is that every two years you have to do something called recurrent training. And it used to be that you had to go to a testing center and take another test and pay for fees and all that crap. But the FAA has changed it to now all you gotta do is go on to their website, take a free training that will update you on any new drone laws, regulations, anything else they want you to know. Take a short little quiz and then they'll issue you a certificate and now you are good to go and you are valid for another two years. So if you followed all 10 of those steps, congrats, you are officially a certified remote pilot in command with your remote pilot certificate. Now, I know that might feel like a ton of steps and a bunch of hoops to jump through, but remember the whole point of these regulations is to hopefully keep the skies friendly and safe for everyone. Now, if you want help studying for the Part 107 exam, check out our prep course that has been used by over 25,000 people. We have an over 99% pass rate on it. We've got tons of reviews. We even guarantee that you'll pass on your very first time or we'll completely refund all the money you paid us. Plus, we'll reimburse you $175 for your testing center fees. It's truly the most painless and fastest way to pass. There's a link for that down below along with a discount code in case you want to check that out. But otherwise, good luck out there. Fly responsibly and enjoy the view from above. Happy droning.